jumps get to be just too big after a while. The other thing is with dumbbells, some of the bigger movement patterns like the deadlift and the squat can't be loaded efficiently and progressively with dumbbells the way we would like to. <coughs> Obviously, upper body exercises can be. And then finally, with dumbbells, particularly you know, for the upper body exercises and particularly for shoulder presses of various types, dumbbells just have too many degrees of freedom, right? All right? So if you get under a heavy dumbbell press, and it's really heavy and you're having trouble controlling it, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of different ways it can go out of control. But, but isn't that good? Not loud enough, really. But, but isn't that good? I, I've always thought of dumbbells as that's a good thing about dumbbells because now you get a degree of freedom in there because that's what you're doing. I'm telling you that I think that's the bad thing about dumbbells. So why? Right. Because it promotes injury. Right? There's all different kinds of ways that dumbbell can go yeah, when it gets out of control. The barbell is far more ergonomic and it's far more dosable. So if you are able to put up a 65 pound press with pretty good form for three sets of five, I know that you can put up a 67 and a half pound press next time for three sets of five with good form. But if you can put up a 15 pound dumbbell press for a set of five, I don't know if you can put up a 20 pound dumbbell press for three sets of five. And if you, have you ever worked with a 50 pound dumbbell, right? I don't, I kind of don't want that over your head, right? So there are safety considerations, there are dosing considerations, and um, there's just the overall flexibility and versatility of that form of work. So you can hurt yourself with dumbbells just as easily as you can with barbells. And uh, there are a lot of options for oversight and coaching. A lot of people are able to do this program on their own with intermittent coaching, form checks. There's lots of online resources available. So it's not that, there's not as much of a barrier there as you might think. A lot of people are able to do the program. But not at home. Right? What? But not at home because you don't have all that equipment. It, you're pretty much. Okay. Do you belong to a gym? Do you belong to a gym? Um, I do. Right, so um, a lot of these gyms now, it's what, $20 a month, right? Something like that. So um, you, could, you can furnish a home gym um, in your basement or on your porch with a squat rack, a barbell, a set of plates, and a platform. Cost you, what, $2,000, $2,500, $3,000 for a reasonably good equipment? will pay for itself in a couple of years. The equipment will last you forever. And then now you've got a home gym. And a home gym, you don't need a bunch of machines. You don't need a bunch of different stuff. You need a barbell, you need a rack, you need some plates, you need a bench. You're done. And now you've got something where you can get progressively stronger for years and years using just that equipment. It's simple and efficient. It's one of the reasons we like it. Other questions? Really? Anybody? Just an observation. Um, my dad died of cancer a couple years ago, and I saw what they did to him at the end of life. And you mentioned something in the beginning about building a reserve. I think that's one thing that this property of an engineer is a larger reserve. Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea that this is a way to build it now in the 50s instead of way too long. Yeah. yeah. Not that I'll ever face that necessarily, but I like yeah. the idea that I'm kind of building. That, that brings up like three different little concepts, which I will expand upon now. The first one is the idea of what we talk about sometimes, the physiological 401 day, saving bones, muscle, mobility, and strength for retirement, right? And it's just like any other retirement fund, the earlier you start, the better off you're going to be, but just because you didn't do it 10 years ago doesn't mean you shouldn't start today, right? So start today. Um, the second thing is you talk about the physiological reserve. That is a phrase that doctors use a lot in, in polite language. We talk about physiological reserve. The guys have no physiological reserve, right? Privately, we call it the three Ps, piss, pork, protoplasm, right? And it makes all the difference if somebody's in the ICU. You can tell which people are gonna make it out of the ICU, back onto the wards and then back home versus being transferred to the eternal carrier. Right? So 
So, and the difference a lot of times basically boils down to piss poor protoplasm. Do they have the physiological reserve or do they not? And strong people are hard to break. They just are, either through illness or through injury. And then the third concept that that kind of ties into is the idea of compression of morbidity, right? And, and people talk about this a lot in the aging studies community. There is no medicine. No nutritional strategy, no lifestyle intervention, no procedure, no magic pill, no magic potion, no magic spell that has ever, ever, ever been shown to increase human lifespan in populations. There is no life extension technology available to us yet. Maybe someday there will be, but no medicine, no exercise, no barbell exercise, no exercise, no nutritional strategy, nothing has ever, ever been shown to expand human lifespan in populations. Not even the Mediterranean diet, right? <laughs> so we may have interventions that help prevent you from getting your life cut short by the diseases of aging, but no, there is nothing that extends the natural human lifespan in populations. So we're actually not talking about that. We're not talking about more years. We're talking about better years. We're talking about compressing the dying part of our lifespan into a thinner and thinner sliver of our lives, right? Decreasing the death span and increasing the health span. That's what we're talking about. So I'm not promising to extend your life. I'm not promising to shrink your prostate, improve your eyesight, fix your bald spot, right? make you look like Brad and Angelina. We're not interested in cosmetic results. This is not bodybuilding. We're not interested in winning a powerlifting competition, right? In this book, we're talking about something very specific. Increasing the health span, increasing the death span, improving your ability to meet old age with independence and vigor and health and strength and durability. That's all. Anything else? Anybody, please, that's why I'm here. Sir. Have you ever worked with anybody with a double hip replacement? Yes. And it's a little bit it's a little bit of a bugaboo. So what came out of that is um, there are hip replacements and there are hip replacements. There are ceramic hip replacements, which in my mind is a bunch of words that should never go together. Uh, and then there are titanium hip replacements. I'm more comfortable training people with titanium hip replacements than with, uh, than with ceramic. We know that we can train people on artificial knees. We've all had experience with that. And there are good reasons to believe that people, at least with titanium hips, can train pretty hard. We're not, we don't, there's no data on ceramic hips, so we don't know what the long-term outcome is for that. So that's one of those situations where I uh, just don't know. And that's an area where we need some data and we're not likely to get it anytime soon. So for me, a bilateral ceramic hip uh, replacement is a relative contraindication to heavy squatting and deadlifting. Relative. Because we just- Natural hips? What's that? Is it nine-year-old? He has natural hips. He's all natural, baby. <laughs> he lives clean, right? Sally, you were mentioning about uh, at lunch about the client who does have the hip replacement right. so and how I, you how you have a client who has bilateral ceramic hips, and um, so we have a, we have a program. He squats, he deadlifts, he bench presses. He gets his benches going way up, right? Uh, and in conversations with his doctor and his sports physiologist and his surgeon, we finally came up with a compromise that everybody could sort of sign off on, except for the except for him. He's not real happy about the client. He wants to squat heavy, but nobody else will let him. And what we do with him is we condition him first. So he spends 10 minutes with high intensity intervals on the bike, 10 minutes on uh, the bag, and some other high intensity interval training. So we basically crush him before he even gets under the bar. So he's kind of working, he's kind of squatting and deadlifting at a deficit. And that's kind of the best that we can do for him. But he's, he's still feeling better and feeling stronger. He's got more muscle and feels a little bit tired. He wishes he could go heavier, but that's what we're, that's what we're after him right now. Is that concerned about the ceramic edge? 
Yeah, we're in, yeah. Because apparently, when ceramic fails, it fails, uh, and we don't we don't know. I mean, we we actually have another one of my clients who's a biomedical engineer, and she, on his behalf, has made all kinds of calls and done all kinds of research. And she's like, I don't know if anybody knows, right? So we found some tolerance tests, but we're not sure that they actually mimic what's going on in the in the living organism in the living state, and so we just don't know. So. Uh, there are case reports of ceramic hip shattering. Now, there are case reports of titanium hips failing too, but when the titanium hip fails, it usually doesn't fail in the titanium. It's usually the bone that fails, right? And that we know how to, that we know what to do about. We just make the bone stronger, right? Um, but with the ceramic hip, we're just, we're just not sure. So, yeah. Mental health? Yeah, that's a good question. The question is, are there are there any, basically what you're asking about is neurobehavioral, neuropsychiatric benefits. And yeah, and barbell training is not unique in this regard. It has been studied in this regard along with a lot of other different forms of exercise. Most forms of vigorous exercise, <laughs> vigorous exercise um, has beneficial impacts on neurocognitive function, on affect, meaning mood, right, depression. Uh, some studies have shown a beneficial impact on memory, uh, well-being. These are all, I mean, memory, affect, well-being, the, the, the methods for these tend to be a little bit sloppier than they are for some other bio, biological outcomes. But there is a pretty large, a pretty large body of data now showing that any form of vigorous exercise improves quality of life and has positive neural behavioral and neural cognitive outcomes. So that's actually been pretty well studied. Yes, ma'am. Um, so what about what the 90-year-old gentleman is back to the gym? High five, yeah. Right, so what if somebody who's dealing with scoliosis? Yeah, yeah. scoliosis is not a contraindication in training. What's his name, Lamar somebody? Like he's a very famous power lifter. Mm -hmm with pretty profound scoliosis who like went home with a lot of trophies, right? So it's, 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 so somebody who's scoliotic has a twisted spine, right? Either congenital or acquired. And what do you do? Well, you can't straighten out the spine, right? Nothing's, nothing's gonna do that for them in the gym. So you just load them and you have them do the movement pattern as, as closely as you can to the normal human movement pattern. You put a bar on it and you load it and their twisted spine gets stronger. Still twisted, but stronger now. So would you rather have a twisted weak spine or a twisted strong spine? I mean, that's really what it kind of boils down to. I mean. I didn't know if there was like some sort of like adaptation issue. Just like no, we let the spine adapt. Mm -hmm. we, do the, we, do the move, we do the natural human movement pattern that they can do, we load it, and their spine adapts. And this, and this is what it boils down to. We have all accumulated scars, right? So you take a bunch of 60 year olds, that is a much more heterogeneous population than a bun, bunch of 20 year olds, right? Like a bunch of 20 year old guys, you can sort of like have like, all of you just go do this. And then you like, and not even like watch, right? They're all gonna do this <laughs> because they're all more alike than they are different. But you take a population of 60 year olds, they're all different, right? And they're all a little bit beat up. We're older, we're beat up, we got scars, we got regrets, we got limitations, right? The choice is simple. You can be old and beat up and weak, or you can be old and beat up and strong. <laughs> I can't stop you from being old and beat up. <laughs> all I can do is make strong. you strong and fit. Sir. Um, did you ever get much pushback from Less and less over time, and the other the other thing is is that we are slowly colonizing the physical therapy discipline, right? So we have a number of coaches in our association who are also doctors of physical therapy. Some of them at academic institutions. So we are slowly getting through to those people. We still get yes, we still get some pushback, and. Um, 
right? Well, so physical therapy is uh, traditionally engaged with muscles and not movements. And, um, and it's actually a pretty heterogeneous, pretty diverse practice. And so um, they're like, no, there's no way you should be having old ladies deadlift and squat. It's like, well, why? Well, explain to us why we shouldn't. Well, because you just, you just don't do that. You're going to hurt them, right? And it happens all the time. It's like, where does it happen all the time? Where's your data? Where's your data? Because I have a ton of field data, and Diego and Emily have a ton of field data that not only does it not hurt them, it makes them stronger, and it makes them better, and it makes them healthier. And fortunately, again, we're beginning, we're, we're beginning to colonize that discipline a little bit. And more and more of, more and more of the younger generation of, of BPT's physical therapists are coming to us, looking for instruction on how to coach and program and perform these movement patterns because they're starting to see the value of focusing on normal human functional movement patterns and making them stronger. That's the real key to physical therapy. So less and less. We're getting less and less pushback from physicians. There's still you know, some people out there who think, doctors think they know what they're talking about when they talk about exercise because doctors think they know what they're talking about when they talk about me. <laughs> oh no, no, that Chardonnay is, not as good. <laughs> I know. I'm a doctor. Right? <laughs> There's just you, you've got to have a little bit of arrogance just to do what I do, right? And unfortunately, it sometimes carries over into your opinion. When actually, the most important attribute for the physician is to have a healthy respect for his own profound ignorance. <laughs> it's hard to come by, but experience in April flattening. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. What about cardio? I always hear that before one exercise, is that your high intensity? Yeah, it depends on what you mean when you say cardio. Like so, they make you work out as aerobic. <laughs> right, aerobic. So that's the question of biological energy systems, basically. Should we train in, should we spend time training like this? In the aerobic energy system. Exerting moderate forces for a sustained period of time. Now, I'm a Marine. And I grew up in the 70s, so it's all about aerobics. All aerobics, all the time. Even in the Marine Corps, and they should have known that, right? That's good exercise. It's certainly better than nothing. But here's what we've discovered. So the way I have people think about it is this. You got really two energy systems. You've heard of anaerobic and aerobic, right? Aerobic is the one we usually think of with cardio, right? The aerobic system is like the plug in the wall. That's the aerobic system. That's your mitochondrial battery. That's the one that uses oxygen. The anaerobic system is like the battery in your laptop. Laptop consumes a lot of power, right? And it drains the it drains that battery pretty quick, right? That's your anaerobic system. Now, the anaerobic system is what we call a high power, low capacity system. In other words, I put that anaerobic battery and I hook it up to a motor and it goes, <laughs> and then it's done. The battery's dead. Right? It drove that motor at extremely high power for an extremely short period of time. That's a set of deadlifts. That's a sprint. That's a wrestling match. Right? Anaerobic. High power. Right? Then there's the wall. I plug that same motor in the wall and it goes <laughs> all day long. Will never stop. Okay, that's, those are your two energy systems. The high power one consumes oxygen. The low or the high power one does not consume oxygen. The low power one does. The power output of that system is anywhere near the power output of this system. The capacity of this system is anywhere near. They're inversely related. Okay. Now, consider this scenario. I'm going to have one of Emily's athletes go and do a heavy set of squats. She's gonna put like 150 pounds on her back and she's gonna do a set of five. Which system do you think that is? The high power? Yeah, it's that. It's that one, right? And she's going to deplete or nearly deplete that system by the time she's done, right? So she drained that battery. In five minutes, she's going to do it again. again. How is that possible? 
We just drained her battery. That high power battery is dead. How can she possibly do another set of five now? Well, she does another set of five in five minutes because in the intervening five minutes, she goes, why am I doing this again? <laughs> right? And what she's doing physiologically is she's taking that high power battery and plugging it in the wall mm -hmm. and recharging it. She's demanding that her aerobic system recharge her anaerobic system. And this is physiologically well described. And when she trains her anaerobic system, she is also training her aerobic system to recharge the anaerobic system. So she's making a heavy demand on it. Anybody who ever tells me that there's no cardiorespiratory component, no cardio component, the way they're I'm like, why don't you watch somebody between a set of squats <laughs> and tell me that there's no cardiovascular component to it? So what we've learned and what the literature on high intensity interval training, which is sort of a revolution in exercise science, has told us is that when we train this high power, low capacity anaerobic system with sprints, weightlifting, high intensity intervals, whatever, we also train the anaerobic system. This is why you can take two groups of kids or two groups of adults and have one group run three miles three times a week, have the other group do high intensity interval training in the anaerobic system twice a week. This group trains for 20 minutes a week, this group trains for an hour and a half, two hours a week. Different energy systems. Before and after training, you look at their citrate synthase, you look at their maximal oxygen uptake and, and their endurance time to exhaustion, right? And then at the end of training, 12 weeks, you look at those things again. What do you find? No difference. You're able to hit the, you're able to hit the aerobic system by hitting the anaerobic system hard. When you hit the high intensity, high power end of the bioenergetic spectrum, you get the whole spectrum. It doesn't work the other way, mm -hmm. right? You can't use your laptop to recharge the power station down the street, right? If you plug your laptop battery into that wall, it's not gonna increase the amount of power available in the energy grid. It doesn't work the other way. So when you work the aerobic end of the energy spectrum, you're not getting high power performance. You're not training the high power end of the bioenergetic spectrum. But when you train the high power end of the bioenergetic spectrum, you get the whole thing. You get your cardio. You're just not working in the energy range that we typically think of as cardio. So it's pretty comprehensive. Sorry, you pushed the wrong button. <laughs> wrong way to answer. How much time do we have? What? All right, we got time for maybe one or two more questions. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I got thoughts on nutrition. So uh, we have a couple of nutrition gurus in our association. I'm not one of them. I'm pretty simple-minded about it, right? So um, uh, I believe that athletes, this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the athlete of aging, right? Needs to monitor all of his recovery parameters and nutrition is a recovery parameter. Check it out. You don't get stronger by lifting weights. Lifting weights does not make you stronger. Recovering from lifting weights makes you stronger. And part of that recovery is your nutrition. You gotta feed the beast, right? <laughs> that means that, right, the time of like salads and yogurt, that's gone. You're gonna eat salad and yogurt and steak, <laughs> right? And stew and roast chicken and scrambled eggs, right? You're gonna get your protein. You're gonna get at least one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. One gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. That's more than the ADA. So yes, she, she, she's shocked. There's like so much shock on her face right now, right? So if you weigh 150 pounds, you need 150 grams of protein a day. That's like kind of work. That's work, right? That's a lot of work. Yeah, it's really hard. That's why God invented protein shakes. <laughs> right. right? That's why there's egg that's why there's egg beaters. That's, that's you know, that's why there's yogurt. Cottage cheese. Right? So cottage cheese. You need to but this 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 touches on a bigger issue. I mean we can talk about nutrition all night, but this touches on a bigger issue and maybe one that we should tend to. Right? Anytime somebody runs into trouble on their program, where's the first place we always look? as coaches, like you're like settling your star, yeah, recovery, recovery, right? I don't look at the technique, I'm looking at, I should be looking at the technique all the time, right? 
the first place I look at re is recovery. When somebody's selling, I say, tell me about your diet. You getting enough sleep, right? You getting, you getting enough active rest in between. How's your, did, are things stressful? There's only a couple of times I've asked people about their sex life, I, I don't do that. <laughs> but it's a recovery parameter, right? Because what you do in the gym is only part of it. This is the difference between exercise and training. Exercise is great. Between exercise and no exercise, I want you to exercise. But exercise is just something that you do today. You go out and you get some exercise. Like, like an idiot doctor will tell you, you just get some exercise. That's not a prescription, we've already said that. Just go out and get some exercise. It's better than nothing. It's better than being a couch potato. But this is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about training. Remember, I said the exercise prescription is a training program. Training is a very special kind of exercise. Training is. The manipulation of training variables as part of a long-term program aimed at the optimization of physiologic and performance parameters. That's a mouthful, right? <coughs> Manipulation of training variables as part of a long-term program aimed at the optimization of physiologic and performance parameters. That means that you log sets and reps, you watch what you eat, you take care of how you sleep, you don't stress out over little things, you get your active rest between training sessions, you make your training sessions regularly. We have a word for people who do this, who manipulate training variables as part of a long-term program aimed at the optimization of physiological performance parameters. We have a word for people who do that. We call them athletes. And when they're over 40, we call them master's athletes. And when you read the book, you'll see that we very quickly stop talking about aging adults and start talking about master's athletes. That's the difference, because exercise is part of a healthy lifestyle, no doubt about it. But because of the central importance on recovery and the way you live your life inside the gym and outside, training is a healthy lifestyle. Being an athlete of aging is a healthy lifestyle. It's not part of it, it is the lifestyle because you want to get stronger and fitter over time. And that is going to reorient the way you think about all the components of your life. Getting enough sleep, hydrating appropriately, avoiding toxins and junk food, getting appropriate nutrition, making sure your macros are dialed in, not freaking out over little things, right? And all of that reorientation is entirely salutary and beneficial. It helps put things into the correct perspective. We don't, we don't live to train, we train to live. But training is a healthy lifestyle. And it puts a lot of things into a new life, into a new and healthy life. It is a healthy lifestyle. A lifestyle of a master's athlete, athlete of aging. That's what we're talking about. We're done. Our rebels now are ended. Thank you all very much. <laughs>